Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we begin on this monumental, biggest selling comic in, in, in American comics history, let's take care of some business, Ed. Yes, sir. I have a Kickstarter up right now for my next comic book. It is a Blacklight comic starring the Russian underground sensation Octobriana. It's called Octobriana 1976. It's available now through the middle of June. I read the comic probably five times at this point. The comic is done. The comic is ready to go. Man, once this Kickstarter is done, I imagine you're going to hit a couple of buttons and uh, books are going to be printed. The bottleneck is going to be when you start uh, stuffing thousands of envelopes, (laughs) baby. (laughs) I also have uh, a Patreon going on. Uh, I was trying to figure out the best way to slide my Red Room comics out to the public and Patreon... Patreon seems to be uh, the the best way to go for me right at this very minute, man. It's uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. I got about the first quarter of issue one up there, man. Um, 96, 97 pages into the series, man. So it's going to be serialized for quite a while. I'm I'm pulling back my uh, Hip Hop Family Tree schedule every Tuesday. New strips. That is awesome, Ed. Like, uh, Like my comic, I have read Red Room the first two and a half issues or so. It's phenomenal, and I think the, uh, the the rolling it out weekly, amazing way to deliver comics. I agree, man. But the task at hand, Jimmy, <laughs> we got to talk freaking X-Men 1. 8.5 million copies of this motherfucker sold. And you know I got at least eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everybody that owns one copy of this owns multiple copies. Sometimes if you have a big collection, it's cheaper in terms of uh, sweat equity to just go buy another <laughs> uh, another issue for a quarter than to uh, dig through 75,000 long boxes. I have heard retailers still talk about having a box of these things in their inventory. Uh, very heavily ordered crazy time this is me reading off the stands you know i bought my issues new when they came out as i believe you did too yeah and uh this was the peak of a certain thing this was the one that seemed to be available everywhere like this is the one you would see in your right aids and, and all of that i don't remember seeing the other stuff um at all but this is definitely the one i had i think like you see how all of these have have this mm-hmm. direct like i got mine on a regular newsstand so it must have had a uh barcode But I think all the newsstand readers were young like me, and we read them shits to tatters, because I certainly did. None of these are the ones that I had when I was a little boy. And these four are not all of them. So they did do a deluxe edition, which collected all of the covers in a gatefold presentation and on glossy paper. Um, Because if anyone missed it, this was a convenient way, I guess, to to pick it up. If if those 8 million copies (laughs) eluded you somehow, you could buy the deluxe edition. And and you're selling old rope, uh, stuff that's already uh, put together, man, and you're marking it up for three times the the, the price? Some minor coloring differences, too, you'll see on the covers with this uh, little different logo treatment, different green backgrounds. Look at that hatching, man. (laughs) <laughs> drive a Mack truck through that. Like, what's the point? Why even bother? It's incredible the way this book sold. It was certainly on fire at the time, comics in general, and the speculator market. Damn near the peak of, of that bubble. You know what, Jimmy? I'm actually going to credit uh, X-Force 1 for really being the catalyst. Not not Spider-Man as much. I mean, obviously, it got the ball rolling with 2.5 million copies. But I was there, man, picking this stuff up as these books were sliding out. And the X-Force 1 shipped in a poly bag with the trading card stuck out like a sore thumb on the spinner rack at the right aid near the canterbury estates apartments that i lived at when i was in third grade in baltimore man uh nobody would leave that alone everybody it 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 fucked with all of us psych psychologically because we needed to see what was inside (laughs) you know yeah i i bought all five of those to get all the trading cards man i i was the mark and uh and they hit it perfectly for me at that time once again man i didn't know anything about uh comic stores and the only cards that were at that same rite aid uh the fucking gideon sunspot card it's the only Uh one that's the only one that was there (laughs) i actually like that character design but not the best that's not the best of that team you want that deadpool card should we talk X-Men 1? Not yet. No? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the copies of X-Men 1 that I have. I got this from an early interaction with a comic book store. And this is from Comic Express. We've talked about Comics Express a couple of times in Wizard because they would always have these ads and it would be like 
10,000 signed copies of whatever book, or more sometimes, huge numbers of autographed comics. And so I didn't realize this was Comics Express until I was getting ready for this episode and and found, you know, your authentication slip. And this is an insert basically for more of their upcoming releases that are going to be available as signed comics, Wolverine 50, X-Factor 75. So... They moved a lot of these. They did. And if it wasn't enough to sell $8 million, they did some signatures and marked them up. You know, this was probably, I don't know, 20 bucks or something at least. Uh, and had to be 10000 of them or more. For a time. Uh, one thing about the Comic Express thing, listen to the Ron Friends uh, shoot interview because he participated in that with Thunderstrike number one. And he <laughs> sort of laid out the business model of how that worked, man. He got basically a dollar a book to sign and spent the weekend doing that and 10,000 signatures in two days. I think you should get more money for the corporal tunnel you're going to have to deal with in a couple years after that. Um, that said, uh, there was when, when, <laughs> when people were stuck with a, with a glut of these things, they tried to think of interesting ways to get the, that stock out of their warehouse space and uh, you would be able to get a a puffy binder. It had like a puffy kind of foam cover, a uh, three ring binder, and it would had the, have these comic sized sleeves. And uh, it would it would give you like say five blank sleeves, and then five of the X Men ones to complete the set. Twenty bucks. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right, man. When you have bulk bulk of this, you got to do something. Last note on this on this edition, it's on coated paper. Yeah. So the inside's going to be a little bit different, and we can kind of flip one of these open just to do the newsprint comparisons. Yeah, and I would prefer to look through the newsprint. Yeah, we will go through the newsprint. I think it'll show up better on camera. But the idea here is this is a deluxe edition, so you're getting a little bit of extra. And and the ba- the back matter in this is extra too. Like it's not in every issue. Yeah. So the the back matter are these spreads of different iterations of x-men and their villains uh, a little bit of jim lee's sketchbook stuff kind of a glimpse of upcoming characters like omega red and uh this inside is actually the, the x universe gate folded out with uh pretty much everybody who was in any of the books at the time so kind of neat the covers themselves are also recolored it's not just that green background but if you look closely it's digital coloring so like there's some blending of colors that are treated differently. You can see like the gradations on on Wolverine's arm, for instance, compared to where the hard edges of like the color steps being cut out, you know, mechanically done, however that process was. Um, It's kind of neat to see just those early days of like an airbrush tool Uh, because coloring would have been 91. Like that's that's pretty early days for digital coloring on comics. And you can see it's it's very, uh, very limited effects, but nonetheless, they did recolor this using those that that process. So kind of kind of strange that they would do it, but you know Jim Lee develops Wildstorm coloring as part of Wildstorm when they go to Image. So definitely something a lot of these guys were uh, cognizant of. When I was a little dude, when I was a little dude, and I saw this, I thought that they were cutting promos, and uh, he was calling her a ho mage. <laughs> Like a like a ho magician, because I didn't know what that word meant. <laughs> this is also its own thing of like all these swimsuit issues. Like Those everything 90s. was a swimsuit issue. Even Amazing Heroes would have swimsuit issues. Those nineties, man. All right, I think that's the the preamble is out of the way. So, uh, which one of these should we uh, flip through, Ed? Does this it is matter? the one that you would see everywhere, man. Right, like I'm, I'm, I'm very partial to that. Dollar fifty. This is a little bit of an oversized issue. That would have been slightly markup, I think. I don't yeah. think the regular series was a dollar fifty, but. And we start out in outer space with a, I guess, a Soviet spacecraft um, going through space and being like hijacked, taken over by a couple of these mutants that stowed away on board, because they want to go see Magneto, who is now living above the Earth on an asteroid that he has crafted this home base on yeah asteroid m was always a thing uh magneto comes back man uh, he was he was uh i believe he was rendered a baby for quite a period <laughs> of time took over new mutants for a while uh was put on trial and uh escaped earth after sinking soviet submarine uh that all happened in the in the old x-men stuff new mutants all helmed by chris claremont who really uh fostered these characters gave them life and all of that uh, Jim Lee comes, man, he's the bell of the ball. This is now an art-driven comic and uh, hard to fucking read. Uh, I, I I don't like this issue very much. Um, 
as a starting point, you imagine you just see number one, you imagine that uh, it would attract new readers. So you want to start off on, on, on a good foot, perhaps maybe have like one uh, naive character that a new reader can uh, tag along with to get introduced to this world. Um, the first pilot X-Men cartoon is a better number one uh, introduction for a reader that, than this is. Um, also, it being an art-driven thing, you really can tell what Jim Lee likes drawing and, and doesn't like drawing. And uh, I'll, I'll point it out every time because, frankly, it's glaring, but probably to uh, some people, they, they just won't pay attention. But just go back real, real quick. Uh, you see stuff like this, and I don't think Jim Lee likes drawing this crap at all. Like, it, it looks so joyless. Uh, and the storytelling, like, there's, there's, it's almost, it's almost non-existent. That said, he does draw cool vehicles and, and designs cool spacecraft. But, um, I, I copied this comic because there's so much pinup worthy pages right. and stuff. Um, but this is one where I'm like not having fun copying it. And I feel like you <laughs> could tell he's not having fun either. That's interesting. This, this comic is pretty dense. Like there's a lot of stuff in here probably a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be in here, but I do get the sense that they're trying to cater somewhat to that number one concept because they do try to cover a lot. We see, you know, not to give anything away, but we see like X-Men training. We see the setup of Magneto and his kind of power position, and then we're going to see them inter interacting and fighting. So like, it's a good bit for one issue. I wanted to uh, draw attention to the credits. So it's by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee, writer, co-plotters, penciler, and then everybody else is sort of credited the same way. And it makes me wonder if they're all viewed the same, you know, like inker, letter, or colorist, are they of the same importance in editorial mind? I have no idea. This is the standard way. Usually the writer and penciler would be a part of this treatment. So I think that probably not a lot of thought is given to it, but looking back on it and seeing like who's doing what, um, Scott Williams, very highly regarded inker, you know, sort of the, the Terry Austin of the 90s and going forward, I mean, a generation or more follows him and his techniques with, with the pen nibs and everything would win tons of uh, comic awards for being best inker. Tom Warzakowski, one of my favorite letters, and I always know him from X-Men. I think if his lettering is bouncy and, and kind of fun and also having to fit a lot of words in panels sometimes, which we'll comment on as we go. Um, Joe Rose's colorist, the coloring doesn't stand out to me particularly in this issue, but of course it has gone on to become a bigger and bigger part of comics and something that Jim Lee seemed to be, you know, aware of uh, pretty early on. So, people have been cribbing the Jim Lee style a, a lot in 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 the '90s, and uh, I wonder if they were doing it much before this exact issue came out, uh, because certainly you you have something that sells 8.5 million copies. You're going to want uh, to try to glom on to some of that. So then you get Alex Saviuk and guys like that. You know, even Herb Trimpey had to do his little stretch of doing this kind of ridiculous cross hatching and stuff. That that isn't even, by definition, that's not hatching. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. There's no really, great value there. It doesn't really describe anything, but definitely a trademark of that style in that era. I like the uh, Jim Lee underlining. This once again to me, this is like such an art driven. Uh, totally agree. Product. So the story is is kind of whatever, man. Basically, these mutants uh, escape Earth looking for Magneto. They become the acolytes, and it's it's these pages. Like there might be one or two panels on every page where it's like the Jim Lee. It, it's almost, and it's so funny to like use this term in regards to to Jim Lee, but it's sort of like as an amateur, like getting into drawing comics. You want to draw the fight. You want to draw the punch. You sh you shit out the uh, location scenery or or whatever. But Jim Lee just because he was so popular and because the sexy stuff stayed sexy, he never had incentive or reason to change that part of his personality and would just like you know dash these things out. That has changed in recent years. He draws some fly ass backgrounds and stuff, but all through this era and certainly through Wildcats. We'll see plenty of examples throughout this issue alone. Yeah. And keep in mind, this was a time of monthly books. You know, so, like, you don't have the chance maybe to run down... Like, like now you can just Google search if you're looking for background or reference. And, and also that monthly schedule is just 
a meat grinder and, and he was working on it. Yeah, but that said, this is this is an introductory book and Jim Lee's the hottest guy ever. They gave him all the time in the world he needed to, to draw this thing, so I won't give him any excuse on that. But certainly the photo ref is hard to come. You had to clip out freaking uh, National Geographic magazines and stuff to get a good arsenal of background. Yeah, and he's pretty young as an artist because those guys would assemble what are known as morgue files their whole career for decades. Jim Lee's only been in, in the game at this point about seven, seven, six or seven years, I think. Like, it's a real fast ascension. Uh, probably not much of a morgue file. That was the incentive for having a studio and being in a studio with several other guys because uh, then you have three or four other dudes who have uh, their entire family, aunts and uncles, saving their magazine subscriptions <laughs> to send to you and every day to the... To the bur- that, I mean, that's how you would get Yeah, it is. It just now. sounds funny in, in, in today's context. Last note for me on this page is this is uh, something that some of the image guys would talk about and be criticized for, and that's creating pages that were had a resale value, which means put some anchor on the page, something that makes that page exciting, a pinup like quality somewhere, a character that people like. And I think that's what you see with this face. And it's something to keep in mind as we continue through, because you're going to, this book is full of these kinds of uh, pinup like moments. Pinup moments that, that get used over and over again on many kinds of memorabilia and, and all sorts of stuff. But it's like, it's like the full figure is one piece and then like the big portraits. Uh, but this comic, like going through it again, it's absolutely like an example of like almost like Jim Lee ain't even trying to pretend to tell a story, man. <laughs> I wonder about that with uh, with Chris Claremont's writing too, because there's so much text in here and I haven't read uh, a Claremont X-Men in a while. It was one of my favorite series when I was a kid, but reading it now, it's kind of like, almost a fight between the artist and the writer as to who can put more of their imprint on a page. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the full fa- faulty nature of collaborative comics and getting a bunch of like alpha males who 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 make these things and and think they're right to collaborate on this stuff because the writer might try to outright the artist might try to outdraw or at least draw pages that can uh, be resold to the uh, exclusion of good storytelling or any of that, man. So, uh it's uh, it's it's selfish stuff but we still fucking bought it i loved it it was also my favorite stuff uh we have nick fury here cluing in the president about what's going on now and and how there's some potential national security at risk depending on how the soviets handle this nick fury was in the uncanny x-men run that jim lee did so you know bringing in all these uh all these favorites so to speak you know this is a greatest hits in a lot of ways of, of what got jim lee to this point yeah for sure and uh nick fury would show up like in punisher and in, in junk man and, and jim lee made Punisher sort of as cool as he is. Like, the popularity he got in the 90s, man, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, because some schmuck did it. We should, uh, we should revisit some of the Punisher war journals at some point. Ah, Jimmy, this reminds me of something, man. I used to take a lot of time to try to, to try to, like, uh, co- <laughs> copy comics, man. I got sort of bored after a while on this one, man. But, uh, I did my best. I used to. I mean, that's how you learn to draw. Like you look at, you look for the sexy, you look for the sexy art, and then uh, try to replicate it. That's a hard thing to draw this many figures and to try to make them the right sizes and stuff. That's a pretty complex composition to copy. Yeah. So this is now we finally get to cut to the X Men, and uh, they're doing like a training exercise where they've broken the the team up. And they're trying to uh, reach Professor X, basically. Yeah, and this is this is a storytelling contrivance as well because there is uncanny X Men and X Men. How do you juggle these guys? Well, there needs to be a yellow team and a blue team. So we're seeing the uh, inception of that. So Wills is going to get some of them. Jim Lee's going to get some of them, and uh, they're going to have to make do. This is that, uh, like the number one. You know, like this is let's introduce everybody, and this is a generic way to do it. This is something that X Men have done a lot of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was pretty disappointed rereading this and seeing that this sequence because it's like there are no stakes. So like, yeah, we get to put everybody's name on the page, but it's not very exciting as a reading experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love this comic growing <laughs> up and, and it had zero to do with the story. Absolutely zero. It had things to do with like, let me try to like draw that, that hip. <laughs> right. You know, like that's a, that's a sexy lady, man. I need to try to figure out how, how, to, how to draw girls that way. Still, still trying to figure that out, by the way. Jim Lee was really good at the static image, like the posed character, because I did the same thing, copied lots of those. And he does all right with dynamic poses too. But that static image is something 
I feel like he brought to Marvel in a big way. Because when I was reading, you know, John Buscema or Jack Kirby, it was all dynamic poses. And Jim Lee shows up, and now it's like these pin-up cool poses. Yeah, and it would be stuff like this. Like, these would be on posters all by themselves, shirts and stuff. But here's another one of those, like, uh, let me just draw this thing before I have my breakfast. And, by the way, this is, these are missiles yeah. that they are sending after everybody in a training exercise. If this goes wrong, do you just die if you're <laughs> one of these X-Men that are training? Like, And also, by the way, seemed extreme. Uh, he's not using... Uh, it's an abuse of the 180 degree rule and all that, but having the missile shoot off there, about to hit them that way, but then you realize they're homing missiles or whatever, but there was a better storytelling approach, but um, Jim Lee ain't interested in that. He's, no, this be, is the approach. These, these, Get a good shot of Rogue in there. These pages from X-Men 1, X-Force 1, and Spider-Man 1 uh, were all sold at a Sotheby's auction, and uh, that was kind of like what brought Todd, Rob, and Jim like to New York to create Image Comics. Like that was like where the conversation was. So these shits were sold at a fucking Sotheby's auction. Uh, I wonder if they knew that going into it or something. But they had to bring in a mint. Yeah, man. And and imagine now they're probably worth a hundred times whatever they sold for. Absolutely. And it really just is like pin up, pin up, pin Jim, up. Jim, Jim, <laughs> let me tell you, man. Because this was the era, I had that image, absolute, 100% sure, this image was on my 5th grade X-Men Valentines that I had in elementary school. <laughs> I remember that, clear as day, hearts all around it in a border. You know, that that's the stuff they would complain about too, like there'd be posters made with their art or shirts or whatever and they wouldn't get any kickback on it, so... You did see these images all over the place. I have to, I have to point this out. Whenever I was um, going through this, my thought here was like, that's gymnast level shit that Colossus can be in that position where he's being held up by the armpits or whatever and is just planked out underneath Archangel and also Archangel being much stronger than, than a regular human to be able to do that. Really <laughs> stupid. Not what I was thinking when I was in middle school reading this. But look, every every character gets gets their fly, like, little money shot image. Yeah, nice, cool lighting from uh, from the control panel underneath. Little little touches. Probably don't take much longer to draw, but just a little bit extra kind of a cool moment. Psylocke was one of the characters Jim Lee, like, redesigned early on in his Uncanny X-Men run. So you get some, some money shots of her, kind of an Elektra uh, ninja-like design. Yeah, she started off Marvel UK... Alan Moore, you know, a pink-haired uh, British girl. And uh, what that, what my editors at uh, on X-Men Grand Design had to keep reminding me was she's still a British girl. Yeah. She's in an Asian body. Because, like, cause like, I would put, like, she was then transformed to an Asian, like, something like that. And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, how about we just ignore that, all that British stuff? And she's just an Asian ninja of the hand like the whole time or something because i i couldn't understand it then her eyeballs are implanted into an assassin's body but she's still the same person fuck that <laughs> like you like, like yeah i, could, I can't tell you that origin i love that that three issue story some of my favorite jim lee stuff but i can't explain what happens in it yeah and and there's language things that that trying to explain it that will uh, get you kicked out of comics yes by the way, not being able to explain things, so they encounter robots in the sewer, Wolverine's, like, B-team that's coming up uh, from under the mansion. These advanced robots, like, maybe the X-Men should concentrate on that. That's amazing <laughs> stuff for 1991, well, and if that's not advanced enough, what exactly happens here with Marvel Girl? She's also a robot that explodes when you kiss her. Jim, uh, when... Professor X comes back from the Shi'ar. He also brings back Shi'ar technology that is incorporated into uh, the uh, Danger Room, and that would include the holographic technology of the different backgrounds and these little robot gimmicks. <laughs> Actually, that detonate upon kissing. I saved. Uh, I saved. Uh, I saved some YouTubers. Um, some some keyboard clicks of the fingers for uh, to explain that to you. Eric Larson, X Men. Yes, man. And uh, when you are going through a Jim Lee X-Men that's firing on all cylinders. When you get to this, it looks passe. It looks like 60s Silver Age X-Men art or something. You know, also, I think he drew it very, very small, and it was blown up, Could maybe. Be. Without seeing the signature, I, my first thought was Art Adams. Like, some of the way the figures are built remind me of Art Adams a little bit. Uh, can we go back just one more real quick? just wanted to point out, this texture was ubiquitous. Yes. And, uh... 
WTF, right? Like, 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 what is that? You know what I mean? It's, it's a, very it's, true. It's trying to be like a double lighting or something or quadruple lighting, but um, it was like a shorthand for metal. Yeah, not not based on reference, but just like it became like I don't know. That's what you would recognize it as. It reminds me of once digital coloring does show up, and there are all of these like radiant uh, gradient radial gradients, right? That are like this, where it'd be a highlight. Um, we'll probably see that in some future number ones. All right, so first team failed because they couldn't tell the difference between the robot, uh, Professor X and Marvel Girl, and the real thing. But while they're gloating about that, Wolverine comes through the floor. Hey, the nose don't lie, man, and he ain't gonna, he ain't gonna sniff out a, a damn robot. He's gonna sniff out the real Charlie. Tag, you're it, you know? Wolverine's a hunter, but when he hunts... He just pats a deer on the ass. He doesn't try to kill it and eat it. Just pats it on the behind, man, to prove that he can. He did that right here with Professor X. So it's like Chris Claremont doing everything he possibly can to inject some character piece in this because Jim Lee is not giving him a lot of room to work with. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned Chris Claremont, Ed. This is, for anybody watching at home, this is going to be his last storyline. Yeah. He leaves X-Men after 15 years after issue three, which wraps up the story that starts here in issue one. I, I wonder about where he's at mindset. Like, do you think he knows he's done at this point and it's just sort of like whatever tricks he's got left, throw them on the page or don't care. I don't know the exact circumstances why he left. He goes on to work with Jim Lee at image. So I don't think it's a, a, a fight with Jim Lee. I think Bob Harris was a point of frustration, but it also could have been, you've been doing this for 15 years. Like talk about a grind. Nah, I, he was, he was totally into it. And, and he, you could, you could, you could, Type his name into into YouTube right here, man, and uh, hear him talk about these sprawling hundred issue arcs that he had planned for these characters and how Cyclops was going to end. It was nothing about the frustration of the grind that was getting him down. He w he would have worked on this forever, and he's admitted that a million times. This is a fun page. It reminds me of wrestlers talking about developing their working punch, so that. In, in one one way I've heard wrestlers say that is like you punch a brick wall, yeah, and and you learn that distance, and that's what this reminds me of, where he pops the claws just uh, less than an inch short of Professor X's head. Cyclops hates it. Cyclops gets put through the ringer. Like you talk about Wolverine smelling the the difference between the robots and the real people, you know, being a hunter, and it's a chance to show his character. Cyclops' character through this arc is like put him through the meat grinder because you have Gambit hitting on his woman, then you have Wolverine hitting on on Charles Xavier here, and Cyclops trying to stop the the rabid Wolverine from going overboard. It's uh, it's it's funny to see those heightened characterizations. Like they're not they're not subtle, right? Comics is a shorthand too, and certainly boys' comics. It's like just just beat the kid over the head so that you know where everybody stands. You know, this isn't a Dan Klaus eight ball comic. It's stuff that you know I was reading in third grade. I can't believe the number of words in these comics. And yeah, we never read them po post manga. This is just un unreadable. <laughs> yeah, we never we never read this stuff e even as a kid. You tr you tried to, and then it's just like ah, oh, whatever, man. That's so a this, very 90s image. This is uh, Nick Fury showing up to be like, we've got problems, and uh, how do we handle this? And there's some divide over whether friend or foe, because Magneto's been both ally and enemy, and uh, they're kind of debating on how do we interpret this and how do we approach him. I love the uh, new redesigns that, that Jim Lee did on... Uh on the X-Men, like Rogue and, and Cyclops' outfit. Cyclops' outfit before this was real whack. It was just that blue with uh, the yellow the yellow tights. And then there was that period of X-Factor where he had like a million X's, like a big X on the chat. And that was like extremely ugly. <laughs> but uh, because of the popularity of the cartoon and stuff, and, and certainly the fact that this sold 8.5 million copies, like this is, an, this is now an iconic costume. This is now, an, you can't think of Rogue or yeah. Cyclops in any other outfits, man. And the first time you saw them was was in this issue, I, and it and it's weird, you know. There's like little weird touches that don't make any sense, but it's just like little Jim Lee flourishes. And whenever like I don't know which relaunch of DC it was, man, New Fifty Two, Rebirth, whatever the fuck, man. But you know, Jim Lee is the guy like designing, redesigning a bunch of the characters, and he's still pulling from these like early '90s aesthetics. So it's like we have new characters, but. It's 2005, but we're going to make them look like 1991. Yes. Aesthetics. <laughs> I always loved that Wolverine. It's a really small drawing, but it feels like a very natural pose of like, I don't know, just the way the weight's distributed and everything. Also, that little circle's dicey. Got to make sure you put it up high enough. <laughs> 
true. So each of these, I guess, had a different pinup in the middle. Oh, I don't didn't realize that. I think so, because that's what's in the deluxe. You have like all five or six of them. Um, but, but things to come, and I was eating this up at the time. This would become Omega Red, who would uh, be an enemy of Wolver from Wolverine's past. And uh, that was a pretty hot topic at this time, early 90s, the, the mysterious Wolverine's origins and this was getting a, pieces th of it. This was a hot character for, for us, man. Like, uh, it, it was we, we finally had a villain. And that was one of the things that Chris Claremont would talk about. Like, he would try to, re he would try to introduce a new villain for, um, for like, every generation. And then also the X-Men comics, like, every generation, there's going to be, like, a main X-Men character that one can can focus on so an effort with uh this story was uh going to be claremont's attempt to like weed out uh magneto as like a major villain like let's let's do away with that and then introduce like omega red the villain for the 90s kind of thing he looks pretty cool there mostly the top ponytail hasn't aged well from the 90s. And then Longshot was a character I never totally understood because he was out when I was reading X-Men. Yeah. But was like, you know, like everybody talked so highly of him, like in interviews and letters columns and stuff. And it was like, why isn't he, why isn't he here? <laughs> like, All on the strength of uh, of what Art Adams brought brought yes. to the table, man. And uh, I was super stoked on the character as well. They they gave, had an episode of the cartoon with him and I totally became obsessed with him. Still, still have the figure. So uh, when I was going back issue diving... Um, I, I, I was there for Sylvestri X-Men, but not like every month I was, you know, corner store buying and shit, but man, if I saw an X-Men cover with, with long shot on it, even in the corner box with the little head, I had to buy it. These were fun gimmicks. I think Liefeld would do that in some of the new mutants or, or X-Force where it'd be like things to come teasing out some kind of cool character drawing. All right. So back to the asteroid M and some violence going on there. Or as, or as I called it at the time, white noise, man, because it's like, I, I'm not seeing a big panel of... I was going to say, there is no anchor on this page. <laughs> right. <laughs> and not much of one on here either. Yeah, and I'm trying to look at some Hugh Hefner white mullet, <laughs> mullet-headed uh, old dude with no shirt. Yeah, a little bit underwhelming, but what are you going to do? kind of sets up, uh, it raises the stakes. So one of the guys who's hijacked kills one of the acolytes. Or, or injures her, I guess, severely. I don't think she actually dies, but looks looks bad, and it causes Magneto to harden a little bit and to become more aggressive. Once again, in an arrow with no reference, like hard hard combat reference material, Jim Lee could draw some fucking craft. He, like he he had some secret knowledge, man. You know what's funny? I wonder if if that's what this is, or if Claremont saw this and was like, oh yeah, a. Uh, forge design and build a new blackbird because it doesn't quite line up with the old one <laughs> yeah which which is fine but it still looks cool yeah it does look cool. you know it's a, it's yeah. a super cool vehicle and uh you know just figuring out how to draw comics is one thing just trying to figure out how to draw a, a human figure that works god forbid you you could draw a good looking female figure to go along with that now you're designing spacecraft that shit ain't easy no for sure for sure. They would always talk about it in interviews, too. Like, I would see McFarlane talk about it. Team books were so much harder because of that. You're not composing panels with one character. You've got to have all of these characters in every shot, almost. You you feel, you feel that looking looking through every page. And I can attest, man, just drawing that X-Men Grand Design. If it was Spider-Man Grand Design, I would have been able to draw that shit in one year. Not three. I think about that with uh, scripts that I would get. And people would be like, are there too many panels on this page? And it's like, count the characters that appear. It's like that to me is more indicative than like your panel stuff. If it's one character in a panel, you can have a lot of those panels. If it's six characters in panels, you get you get three or four of those at the most. So Magneto raises a nuclear sub that he had wrecked previously. Get a little flashback on that. And basically to get the uh, the nuclear weapons is what he's pulling out of the that wreckage. Good issues. I, I think it was uh, I think it was Uncanny X Men two hundred, John Romita Jr. issue if I if I remember correctly. Uh, where he, he where he gets sentenced and has to go off and all that double sized issue. It's a good one, man. And this is when the X Men come calling. Yes, man. And this is the uh, you re you remember the Jim Lee issue, man? When after the Siege Perilous, when we next see Rogue, she's like in the Savage Land with with uh, Magneto. Good good issues in my uh, young reading. Oh, experience. totally. Once again kind of unreadable because you're like yeah. what the fuck is happening here uh but super cool to look at because it's jim lee drawn dinosaurs and nick fury's in that one but this kind of dynamic right here the magneto rogue dynamic 
will be ex exploited by the jobbers in about a mm, decade, no, about seven years later when they do Age of Apocalypse. Jim Lee was, was the best at drawing the women of this era, better than McFarlane or, uh, or Liefeld or Larson. Silvestri could give you a yeah, run for your money on, right. on, on, X, on Uncanny X-Men. He could draw like the best rogues and storms and stuff. Yeah, you're right. I don't think of him as those big, like the big three, you know, the McFarlane and... Uh, no, yeah, sure, definitely. But you're right. He, he could definitely draw women really well. Um, so, a little bit of a fight. It escalates very quickly, which is not something... It, th I don't know what the X-Men's plan was here. Because when things go out of control almost instantly, you realize they never resolved what their strategy was for talking to Magneto or fighting him or whatever earlier. You know, like the point comes up. But whenever they meet, it just the wheels just go off instantly and it becomes this brawl that doesn't help anyone. Chris Claremont did what he could with, yeah. with, 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 with the art that came back after, you know, he, he gave Jim Lee the plots or whatever, but, uh, I think so too. This was on my X-Men Valentine cards <laughs> as well. <laughs> I gave that such to a, a similar... Sarah. <laughs> I hope she was just really confused because <laughs> what the hell? She gave me some rainbow bright <laughs> bullshit. So it was even, <laughs> Game some lamb chop. I feel like we've seen this this shot before. I think this was in an extinction agenda. Maybe it may have been used several times. It, it feels like that's a pose I've seen uh, I've seen used by Jim Lee before, and then copied by other people as well. And might I say, Jimmy, I don't know that that should have been approved by the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> Call me crazy. Are they still even active? Is this comic approved by the Comics Code? Take a look on the front. Wolverine takes a uh, a pretty hard shot here that, that could have been fatal if not for armor being involved. And that, that kind of opens up Magneto's eyes like, try to kill me. Horseshoes and hand grenades always with those fucking claws. It's almost like, why not just make them uh, squirt guns or something? <laughs> like, if you're not going to like ever let this fucking guy use them. Uh, this is some good morbid morbidity, man. Where, yeah. where he's actually like, he gets thrust inside the Soviets. This is the, this is the pathos. Of the entire issue, man. He gets thrust into the submarine, and he's amongst all the skeletons of uh, the guys that he he killed. He's responsible for creating these these bodies. And in the caption, once again, it's it's uh, Chris doing everything he can to try to inject some kind of characterization. And uh, we can't forget that. You know, first off, Claremont's the guy who who made Magneto more than just like the snidely whiplash, tie the girl to the train tracks kind of character by giving him that origin of being like a, I forget how you say it, like a, a Ashkenazi Jew um, who went through the camps and all that. Mm -hmm. He's got he's got the tattoo and all that stuff, man. So just drawing some of those parallels here as, as best he could. I like that Cyclops visor being a little bit lit up in the back like a silhouette, but just the red of the visor. Yeah. That's a nice little detail. So he leaves with his uh, with his bombs more or less successful. Rogue follows him, uh, setting up that or, or continuing that kind of subplot that those two have some connection. And Soviet fighter jets cause problems there. Yeah. So they attack. It messes up Rogue. Magneto responds with uh, with the detonating one of those bombs, and uh, pretty much worst case scenario, it's on. Pretty cool uh, Chris Claremont novel advertisement. Yeah, man. Like, with the verbosity of his of his comic book scripts, <laughs> you would want these to be about 800, 900 pages a piece, right? I would be curious to read one. Me too. Me too. And look at this primo fucking ad space in a comic that sold 8.5 million copies. Like, this had to, like, land it on a best bestseller list for a week, you think? I don't know. He gives numbers in one of those wizards that we looked at, and it's like the second one sells almost nothing, I think. Mm. So you would think this would be the greatest thing ever. I don't know if it was. I don't know that these books sold very well. Yeah, and, and, you know, all things being relative, it probably would almost be guaranteed a, a slot on the New York Times bestsellers list today, just because more people read books back then. Yes. All right. I think we're... Uh, still a few more pages. <laughs> <laughs> Good color treatment. The, yeah. The brooding Magneto. Things went very wrong, and uh, and he's recovering now from injury. Acolytes are stepping up, kind of, uh, I don't know about manipulating him, but certainly their vision of what they want to happen seems like that's the direction this is taking. This this part of the story, like if you're trying to follow along, this is where things get very rushed, because he's escaping 
on one page. Now he's brooding, and now Rogue has been like in a Genosian hospital for who knows how long. Right, and of course everybody's dubious of Genosha because of their history of anti-mutant um, once persecution. A, once again, like that is not crosshat. That is a checkerboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people always got wrong that copied him. Yeah. And uh, here we are, the Acolytes. Yep. Uh, in costume. Don't know where the costumes came from, but it didn't take them long to get a team get, get a team look together. Yeah, where, where do those costumes ever come from, man? Everybody's a seamstress in the Marvel Universe. <laughs> Gotta have one on your team, at least. <laughs> so they go there to bust Rogue out. She responds by fighting them, and uh, the X-Men show up. So... It's on. You get a few more of your money shots. The the Wolverine fastball special or whatever it is, slashing, cutting, and slashing. Um, Psylocke with her. She could do this from a distance, but prefers the the rush of the physical combat. Uh, she's explaining in her thought balloons because there's not enough dialogue. Let's add thought balloons to get a few more <laughs> words on the page. Oh, you're in for a treat in about in about a half hour, Jimmy. Man. So this is your conclusion of X-Men 1 and uh, Magneto back in full-on, I guess, villain glory. Or is he, man? We, we, we shall see. And, uh, yeah, there it is. Claremont would always have these little things, too, like the subplots of a hint of something going on. So Myra McTaggart is, uh, it ends with saying it's all her fault that these terrible things are happening. And I can't remember where this subplot goes or why she's responsible or any of that, but it was something that would frequently pop up in those X-Men, as I remember, where early in my reading, I'd have no idea what this was. But over a few issues, it would start to... You'd get a few more and, and string together what's happening. That's what I would be into more than mm -hmm. the, the, the main action, is just, like, the, the life of the characters. Yeah, once, once I got a, several issues in... That was the best, because it was like the update of each character. Right, yeah. Like, like the, the fights are a contrivance, and, and uh, you even in a lot of interviews, John Byrne, people would be like, uh, yeah, Chris would just write a 20-page a comic of them living their lives if he was allowed to. Like, like we, have to, we have to force him to, like, give us some fights to draw and blah, blah, blah. That force feels present in this comic to me. It, it feels like two different visions colliding yes and and that and that could that could work sometimes man that's that's stan and jack you know what i'm saying like like uh you know let jack go off do his thing and uh and make his comics here's the thing though grab any fucking random issue of commandy and have no idea what's going on in any of the previous ones it is a fun and super enjoyable reading experience now now he wrote that but so that so that doesn't quite count like in in in, in that regard but same goes for Fantastic Four issues. Just grab one, and it's fun. Reading a random Stan and Jack Marvel comic is actually more fun than reading a bunch of them in order. You know what I mean? Because you could like use your own imagination to kind of like imagine where things were and where things are going. Um, Those books are built so well to be read standalone. Also, yeah. like and, they are a fun, a fun comics reading experience. And, and this is still that era, but but um, Chris Claremont built so much equity at Marvel that he. Uh, perhaps through hubris, I just assume that he would be the guy writing it forever, man. It's it's it is the pretty woman thing, like the you know don't kiss your John, don't 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 fall in love kind of thing, because you know you get screwed over in the end. Um, but visually, you know, like if you had to if you had to drop a matrix and put like the strengths in different categories, visually this is like a perfect book for, you know, a 10 year old boy that, that just wants to look at cool costumes and different poses has zero to do, uh, with, with the story. Yeah. I think that's a pretty fair assessment. I don't know if there's anything extra. Yeah. Continuity studios, musketeer, three musketeer. <laughs> I don't know if I count that as much of a bonus, but sure. Del Keown, uh, Hulk, uh, ad, ad gimmick for the subscription. You know, this is what I thought of reading this, is how much these character designs look like action figures. All their costumes feel that way. Um, and I think I think guys were conscious of that. You know, I think that generation of cartoonists, Rob Liefeld's talked about that a lot. And I think Jim Lee, you can see it in his, in his costume and character designs a lot in this issue. You know, the little tweaks here and there that just feel like, yep, that makes it a perfect action figure. You know, right. it almost feels like you're playing with toys looking through this. Um, 
I, I like that idea that Claremont contributes a significant piece of Marvel's worth yeah. through what he did at X-Men. And it makes me think of who else is responsible. So, of course, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, huge amounts. Ditko and probably Ramita, you know, a few people that made Spider-Man really into what Spider-Man becomes. Um, but Claremont and the X-Men, significant. And 15 years writing these characters, pretty unbelievable. When he talks about the experience and when he talks about specifics to his his narratives... He'll say, you know, and then Kitty, blah blah blah, and then yeah. and then and then Betsy, you know, she didn't like 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 he. It's all worked out in his head. He thinks of them like as people in a way, like like they are voices in in his in his mind, man. And he addresses them by their Christian names and shit. That's funny. Um, I wonder. I quit reading X Men while Jim Lee was still drawing it. Yeah lost interest in it and it almost feels like so he's he. burnt, burnt out even at this point you know like coming off of uncanny x-men was so freaking hot you know his run on it and he was on that for i don't know a year a little bit more you know where it's a big demanding monthly book that was just scorching red hot it feels like he may have been burnt out at this point already um certainly like this is not I don't think this is his fastball in terms of drawing. I think these hands are not as good as most of his hands. Some of the rendering looks like it's just very quickly dashed out. Yeah. So I I, I wonder about that too. You know, it's um, sometimes you get paid to repeat yourself, I often say. Definitely. And in a lot of ways, I wonder if Jim Lee peaks before this issue in terms of X-Men. I think he does. I, I definitely think he does, man. Uh, it's... His 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 heaters, man. It's like Extinction Agenda era, and and I think I think he's a competitive guy. Like I don't know anything about him, never spoke to him. But when you have this like crossover that you're doing with other books, and uh, so you got competitive teams. So I think that that lights a fire in that dude or something. And those those issues are incredible in terms of of the art, man. All right. Uh, anything else said on X Men number one? No. Very happy to revisit it. Um, because, uh, you know, rose colored glasses, retrospect, whatever they say about that stuff, man, rose quartz glasses. Um, so it was fun to, to dust it off again, but, uh, you know, I'll dust it off again, maybe in another 20, 25 years. I think it's interesting in the context of where Jim Lee is today. You know, a lot of the guys that were so hot in 91 haven't maintained that, you know, they, they certainly peaked back then. And in some ways, Jim Lee continues to, I don't know, push new ground continue to ascend through you know his influence on comics like it hasn't gone away at all i remember whenever he returned to batman and it was almost like a rebirth of direct market comics or something it was so you know it it really had an impact in a way that say marvel heroes reborn didn't in the late 90s uh which was interesting to me so kind of need to revisit it because he is still a major player in comics and uh and one of the the top i suppose players in comics today yeah man when i was doing uh x-men grand design like when you do the trades uh, i could pick whatever issues you want to reprint in the back and everything man so i chose like one of those um it's like the one sort of um standalone issue that that uh Jim Lee did. It was the one with Captain America. 268, I believe. Yeah, something like that. 268, 265. I think that's the issue when he's like officially on board as the the monthly, you know, as as the regular guy. He had done a few issues leading into that. But man, I remember that issue distinctly. Super good, yeah. Really strong. Uh, it, it, it was fun because, you know, you can choose whatever you want. So uh, it was kind of fun knowing that, like, I am going to uh, be sending a royalty check, a Marvel royalty check to uh, Jim Lee, the publisher of DC Comics. <laughs> You're welcome, man. Buy, buy me some scrambled eggs next time at uh, San Diego, man. Yeah, I bet Marvel sends him quite a few royalty checks to this day. Hey, man, don't don't ruin my my San Diego <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> Let's get out of here, Jimmy, man. Like, hit him with that Kickstarter info. October 1976, Blacklight comic book, up right now on Kickstarter. Super stoked for you, dude. Hit my Patreon uh, patreon.com slash ed piscor got about a quarter of the first issues worth of uh, red room up there to start new pages every tuesday real outlaw comics real outlaw comics motherfuckers man and uh <laughs> i'll leave that at that man <laughs> well i make sure you subscribe to the channel hit the bell so that we can notify you whenever uh, new vids are available what, what else do we got jimmy subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video uh you can find cartoonist kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video i'm gonna go try to master my scott williams ink technique man give them the march orders dude read more comics